नमस्कार राम मापट स्मृती व्याख्यानमालेच्या वतीनं मी आपल्या सर्वांचं स्वागत करतो या व्याख्यानमालेमध्ये मागील वर्षापर्यंत श्रीयुत सदानंद मेनन श्रीयुत गुलाम मोहम्मद शेख प्राध्यापक शिव विश्वनाथन प्राध्यापक के सच्चिदानंदन आणि श्री टी एम कृष्णा यांनी आपले विचार पुष्प गुंफलेले आहेत यापैकी टी एम कृष्णा सोडता इतर चारही वक्त्यांचे विचार आपण आता यूट्यूबवर पण पाहू शकता ऐकू शकता त्याचप्रमाणे या चारही वक्त्यांचे विचार पुस्तिकांच्या माध्यमातून वाचू शकता संग्रहित करू शकता प्राज फाउंडेशननी या पुस्तिकांची निर्मिती केलेली आहे आणि त्या पुस्तिका विक्रीसाठी बाहेर उपलब्ध आहेत आज या व्याख्यान मालेतलं सहावं व्याख्यान इथे होणार आहे आणि हे सहावं पुष्प गुंफणार आहेत डॉक्टर प्राची देशपांडे इथे सभागृहामध्ये बरीचशी मराठी माणसं उपस्थित आहेत तसेच अन्य भाषिक सुद्धा उपस्थित आहेत आणि प्राची देशपांडे या मराठी जरी असल्या तरी त्यांचं भाषण मात्र इंग्रजीतूनच होणार आहे <coughs> या वर्षीपासून आम्ही एक नवा पायंडा पाडू इच्छितो आणि तो असा आहे की या व्याख्यानाला आज अध्यक्ष असणार नाही आहेत तर एक निव्वळ निमंत्रक म्हणून मकरंद साठे हे डॉक्टर प्राची देशपांडे यांना रंगमंचावरती साथ देतील या व्याख्यानमालेसाठी प्राज फाउंडेशन त्याच्या संचालिका परिमल चौधरी साप्ताहिक साधना पाक्षिक परिवर्तनाचा वाटसरू सर्व वृत्तपत्रातले संपादक वृत्तपत्र प्रतिनिधी वृत्तचित्र प्रतिनिधी तसंच ऑल इंडिया रेडिओ स्टेशन पुणे शूटिंग करणारे बार्स अँड टोन्सचे सहकारी ध्वनीमुद्रण व्यवस्था असणारे महेश गायकवाड आणि त्यांचे सहकारी या सर्वांचं सहकार्य लाभलेलं आहे त्यामुळे त्यांचं मनापासून आभार मानतो त्यांना धन्यवाद देतो तसंच आपण सर्व इतक्या उत्साहाने आनंदाने इथे आलेला आहात आपलेही आभार मानतो आपल्याला धन्यवाद देतो आता मी प्रथम मकरन साठे यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी प्राची देशपांडे यांना मंचावर आमंत्रित करावं <laughs> परिमल चौधरी यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजच्या वक्त्यांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करावं पुष्पगुच्छा सोबतच चारही वक्त्यांची पुस्तिका सुद्धा त्यांना आपण सप्रेम भेट देत आहोत मकरन साठे यांना विनंती करतो की राम बापट व्याख्यान माले संदर्भात थोडक्यात निवेदन करावं आणि प्राची देशपांडे यांचा परिचय करून द्यावा धन्यवाद थोडक्यात निवेदन करतो कारण बरेच लोक मेनी ऑफ यू हॅव बीन हिअरिंग मी फॉर लास्ट सिक्स इयर्स वी हॅव बोथ ऑफ अस अँड डिबेटेड विदर आय शूड स्पीक एट ऑल बट देर इज देर आर बाउंड टू बी सम न्यू यंग पीपल इन द ऑडियन्स दे डोंट नो एनिथिंग अबाउट राम बापट बट बिफोर दॅट आय वुड लाईक टू क्लॅरिफाय अँड वन मोर पॉईंट दॅट इज द ब्युटी ऑफ इंडिया ॲक्च्युली प्राची इज नॉट ॲक्च्युली महाराष्ट्रीयन शी हीज अ कन्नडी का सो सो बट शी नोज ऑफकोर्स Marathi but this is the beauty that so many languages co- coexist in India and she is going to speak about uh, those languages for the young audience here mainly only in two sentences professor bapat was an extraordinary public intel- intellectual really extraordinary he uh, had interactions with people like me and gajanan from theater from social scientists and political activists social activists artists common people everybody he bridged the gaps 
between all these sections of the society virtually single-handedly for decades. And so many of you, even in the audience, must have been helped by his interactions. Unfortunately, we do not have the capacity to carry forward his and work as he did himself. So we plan to invite people like Prachi who have, who share the similar kind of a, and wild worldview and deep intellectual understanding and analysis capacity. Uh, Professor Bapert's three main concerns were the society and politics and arts and literature. So we, we request every speaker, we give them only our uh, request saying that you please base your topic on this tripod of politics, society, and literature and arts. The rest of the specific topic is totally left to them. As Gajanan already told you, we have had excellent five speakers and we are extremely lucky to have an equally eminent speaker today, Dr. Prachi Deshpande. In short, her, I will just be and a very brief about her introduction. Dr. Pachi Deshpande was educated at Ferguson College and Jawala Nehru University, New Delhi. She completed her PhD from Tufts University in Boston, in USA in 2002. She taught at the Colorado State University, Rutgers University in Newark, and at the University of California, Berkeley. Since 2010, she is Associated Professor of History at the Center of Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Deshpande is the author of the book Creative Past, Historical Memory and Identity of Western India, 1700 to 1960. If anybody of you has not read this book, please do go ahead and read it. It's an excellent book. Published by Perman Black in 2007. This is a study of the emergence of modern historical writing and narrative in Marathi. It studies the intervening of history and memory and the importance of historical memory to the making of a modern Marathi regional consciousness. The book examines wide-ranging genres such as bakhars, novels, analytical prose, poetry, plays, and cinema across two and a half centuries of Marathi textuality and provides a very complex social history of Marathi historical narratives. Uh, she is currently working on a book on the cultural history of uh, languages and she has a very different take on it as uh, and we will hear soon. The book project explores the world of bureaucratic writing to think of the relationship between the writing, script and language. It studies how multilingual worlds in the early modern era transformed in today's regionally based language practices. So today's talk will draw on some of this current research. And the title of her lecture is A Cultural History of Language, Some Insights from Marathi. As Gajanan already told you, there is no chairperson, so the event will end immediately after her talk ends. There is no question and answer, this being a memorial lecture. Usual, please switch off your mobiles. Even if there are ads now of some company, we can say that you keep the mobiles on, you please switch them off. Uh, thank you very much. And Prachi, please. Thank you, Makarand. Uh, thank you, Gajanan. Thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to speak here at this very, very prestigious uh, event. Um, I have heard the YouTube videos of the previous speakers, and uh, I confess uh, to having severe performance anxiety. Uh, um, I did not know Professor Bapat uh, myself, um, although I have seen scholar after scholar thank him in uh, their acknowledgments. And it is well known among scholars everywhere within Maharashtra, India, and abroad how crucial he was as a mentor, as a guide for archives, for thinking about uh, topics, for revisiting you know, crucial uh, issues that were thought to be kind of resolved and, and so on. So I consider it a big uh, regret that uh, he was quite unwell by the time I started to do my work and I wasn't able to actually draw on his, his guidance. But uh, in some small way, I'm, I hope I'm able to do justice to uh, his, his memory through my talk today. So um, I have been uh, working on this project 
for a few years now. I started after finishing my first book uh, researching Maratha clerks and scribes who had gone to different parts of the Maratha empire in the 18th century. I was interested in sort of thinking how these migrations took place to Bundelkhand, to Tanjavur, and so on. But then, um, as I, I progressed a little further, I became quite interested in the fact that wherever these scribes had gone, there are still very, very large archives in the Modi script, record keeping of different kinds that are still preserved in these states everywhere. And I became more interested in the materials that these scribes produced rather than the scribes and their family histories and so on themselves. Um, and that led me to thinking about what the Modi script was. I started chasing the Modi script everywhere uh, I went. And I thought that I would actually do a kind of, of history of the Modi script itself. And that is what has led me over the last few years to think about what the relationship is between script, between language, and between writing as a practice, as a profession, as labor, as a bodily act, and so on. And so I'll speak a little bit. I mean, you know, this is the first time I'm actually kind of uh, bringing out some of the, the insights together of this, this research. I'm very happy to share them with you. So um, what do I mean by the history of, of writing or the cultural history of writing, as I will, I will argue? So I'll spend some time explaining this conceptually and then come to the Marathi context. We tend to think of the history of writing and script as part of the history of language, but mainly as a technical or mechanical aspect of it. So the questions we usually ask are, is the writing on palm leaf? Is it on paper? Is it written with a tark or a boru? Uh, the discussions are usually about deciphering the content or preserving the medium. They often end up about evolving technology. First, there was the word. Then there were scratches on the wall. Then came tablets. Then came paper, computers, and so on. The discussion of scripts is also very heavily framed in these evolutionary terms. Questions about when a particular script was invented, which scripts are the oldest, how one evolved from the other, have dominated large-scale discussions about writing and, and script. Scripts have also been sites of identity, of symbolism, and sentiment. We are all familiar with the story of how Hindustani bifurcated into Hindi and, and Urdu in the 19th and 20th centuries and came to be written in, in different exclusive scripts, the Devnagari and the Nastalik, and also came to be symbols of two opposed religious communities, Hindu and, and Muslim. Uh, particular scripts have also been associated with specific religions. There is the ongoing movement to associate uh, the Punjabi language with the Gurmukhi script exclusively, rather than with, with uh, Persian and Shahamukhi and, and so on. Across the world, you will find many, many examples uh, where nationalist movements have become focused, have taken up the symbolism of specific uh, scripts. Now, within the history of language, when we think of writing, we usually think of creative compositions, that is, literature. This literature could be oral and then written down, or it could be directly in written form. But it is the dominant framework for the history of a language, which is usually styled as history of so-and-so literature, history of Marathi literature, Gujarati literature, so on. Once again, origins and evolution are important here. Which was the first literary text is an important question. How did styles, genres change over time? And in such discussions, it is the content of the writing that is central. The apparatus and the material process of, of writing have, at best, an antiquarian importance. That is, we discuss the available manuscripts of a particular literary text and determine their age on the basis of handwriting or the type of paper, quality, etc. Now, when the history of language is based on linguistics, etymology, that is vyutpatti, or phonological and morphological shifts are important. Here too, the earliest available writing in a particular language helps us date that language in specific points in time. What language family a language uh, belongs to helps often determine what official script will be chosen for that language. 
But the everyday practices of writing, which is what I'll, I'll talk about, do not figure in these large sweeps of time that uh, historical linguistics usually deals with. Now, these approaches are all valid. They have given us very rich histories. They continue to give us very rich histories of language and, and literature. So what does a cultural history approach do that is so different, you might ask? What can a closer focus on writing and scripts, not as technological media, but as cultural artifacts in themselves, tell us about the history of language usage and language practice? So, in order to do this, let me just spell out first what I mean by cultural history, right? Now, cultural history first began as a supplement to military and political history. There would be chapters at the end of a book, you know, specifying what the cultural achievements are of a particular dynasty or an era. And the more defined history then of temples, of art, of painting, and so on, grew out of this initial move. But over the last few decades, several scholars have reframed cultural history to investigate the building blocks of a culture. Drawing from anthropology, they have asked, how do concepts and categories, and indeed knowledge, establish themselves? How does the meaning of concepts and people's perception and experience of them change over time? How is such experience shaped and reshaped by power relations in society? This cultural history also disrupts the idea of culture as something wholesome, something that gradually builds smoothly over layers of time. You could say it actually slices into these layers to investigate their formation and understand how meanings take shape through conflict and change. The writings of the French theorist Michel Foucault have been an inspiration for this kind of cultural history. In his sweeping work um, of the unfolding of modernity in European society, Foucault emphasized discontinuities rather than smooth continuities, uncovering fault lines and gaps and awkward transitions in what actually appeared on the surface to be a smooth cultural transition across eras. Another way to understand this kind of cultural history uh, is to say that it defamiliarizes what you think is actually very, very well known and familiar, right? So, you know, when you take a familiar word, even so just say culture, and you peer at it and you pronounce it over and over again, and suddenly after saying it for the 20th time in a row, it begins to suddenly sound different to you, unfamiliar and weird to you, and its syllables and sounds somehow come apart and loom large in your eyes and, and, and ears. Now, linguists call this semantic satiation, but you could say that cultural history does that with well-known everyday concepts and practices. It takes apart familiar concepts and explores how different meanings come to be attached to it, how such concepts are materialized in everyday life through cultural uh, practices, and how they are practically experienced by ordinary people. Now, one of the areas of study uh, through which this new cultural history put forward this method was the 16th century when the printing press spread across Europe. This was a time of great change in early modern Europe and although historians had studied it exhaustively, print was studied as primarily a kind of technological agent of, of change. The objects of focus were then what kind of press, what kind of ink, what kind of, of book binding methods, who were the publishers, the printers, etc. But the new cultural historians showed through diverse and exciting work that the printing press transformed not only the technology of, of reproduction, but also deeper concepts of language, of community, nationhood, personhood. French historians working on Montalité and book history, anthropologists like Benedict Anderson, later on Brinkley Messick, demonstrated that reading and writing practices are not timeless, universal, general skills. They are historically situated cultural practices that are embedded in particular social contexts and mentalities. Moreover, cultural history showed in a, a variety of ways that reading and writing are not only mental and creative activities, but they're also material bodily acts which formed an important part of the overall makeup of the self. So probing these different aspects, the scholarship asked in different ways, how did print and modernity change how ordinary people related to books and their culture of reading? What did it do to the daily drudge 
of clerks writing away in, in offices? How did the organization of knowledge and the use of language on a written page, as well as in larger cultural discourse, change for governments, schools, families, and individual men and women with the coming of print? Within the, the Indian and South Asian context, scholars have written widely on the impact of, of print on, on Indian society. On, on Maharashtra in particular, of course, there's Veena Narigal's uh, landmark work on, on the subject. Uh, the arrival of the printing press has rightly been seen as the arrival of modernity. Um, in the subcontinent. And we know that print brought newspapers, textbooks, and it galvanized Indian languages. It generated debates over script, orthography, and the ways of improving mass literacy. It also resulted in a surge of creative writing in new genres and produced new regional and national imaginations. But just using the, the conceptual framework that I outlined above of cultural history, I want to probe uh, the cultural history of writing and language in the particular Marathi uh, context. Rather than this creative expression, I'm going to focus on writing as the actual act of inscribing letters on paper. Pandrevar Karakarno. So what I will do today is put before you four glimpses four very different disparate glimpses of the moments of the world of ordinary writing and everyday documentation from different periods and, and spaces. By considering them together, let us see how the sources help us flesh out uh, the different social and material environments in which documentation was, was done. So I'll then, towards the end, draw back and, and consider the implications of studying such practices for the history of Marathi language usage and users. So my first glimpse. Now, documentation in, in Marathi began early in the medieval era. But it really deepened in the sense of record keeping with the establishment of the independent Maratha state. This record keeping was on paper in the Modi script, and it was produced by Karkuns and uh, maintained in Daftars in a heavily Persianized Marathi. We have excellent surveys of this deepening bureaucracy, Shanna Zoshi's work, um, earlier work, recent work by Sumit Guha, Rosalind Nun Hanlon, Anuradha Kulkarni's very valuable recent collection, Lekhan Prashasti, you know, which shows us like these samples in Modi script and their transcribed uh, versions of the different kinds of documents that were produced across the Maratha uh, administration. But what's interesting is that this deepening of bureaucratic writing produced discussions about what good writing was and how it should be done. So I'll discuss one set of texts in a genre known as mestak, which put forward uh, conceptions of the ideal lekhak. Yeah. Mestaks were a series of record keeping manuals, and they usually have the name of Hemadri or Hemadpant, uh, the legendary scholar and minister at the Yadav court in, in Deogiri, as the original author of uh, this scribal knowledge. His name often appears in their titles too. So one text, for instance, uh, which was first published by Vika Rajwade, um, is known as, is styles itself as the Hemadri Virachit Pishat Chalipika. Now, the texts, these are not literally written by, by Hemadri. Uh, they're actually dated from the mid 18th uh, through the early 19th century. And some are direct record keeping instructions, how to make columns, folding the paper, what to write where, revenue records, etc. And the others put forward a series of do's and don'ts for the lekhak. The famous sort of Rajvevahar Kosh, which I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, translates Mestak as Lekha Paddhati, but the Mestaks themselves describe their content as Lekhana Kaushalya Vidhi or Lekhana Adhikar Karthavya Vidhi. Right? So you can understand some idea of what they see themselves as. Now what are these texts about? They give basic information on how to make a reed pen, Kohalaitsa B Karun Boru Karaitsa, nibs, how to make ink, lots of recipes. Alongside, they also tell us how the writer must conduct himself. 
it's perhaps necessary to specify that these are normative texts, right? As in they tell us what the writer ought to do. We cannot automatically assume that this is how the writers therefore conducted themselves all the time, even though we get a wonderful glimpse into the daily workings of the, the, the office. So one mesta called Shano Panachi Paddhati, which was first published by Saga Malshe, specifies which type of boru is auspicious, which one is not, how exactly to hold the pen with three fingers, not four or five. Um, and it also has opinions about which behavior is lucky or unlucky. The writer must not cross over the paper. He must not keep a book uh, at his, his pillow uh, when he is, is sleeping, because all of these can bring bad luck. So there's very kind of mundane as well as somewhat kind of, of uh, more esoteric um, information. The texts introduced young Karkoon recruits in the Maratha administration to the hierarchy of posts. So one mestak called the Gaibati Lakshan Gramadhikar, which manuscript I found in the Marathi Manuscript Center's digitized uh, collection, um, uh, describes them like this. The Waknis, or news writer, has a prodigious memory. The Chitnis is a speedy writer and composer. The Surnis is a careful writer who needs to be aware of different kinds of documents before attesting them. The Nyayadhish is the fount of truth but is also a knowledgeable writer. The Mushrif has his eye on expenses and is a business-like writer. The Fadnis is the very personification of writing materials and the Daptaradhipati is not only in charge of the office but someone who also knows ordinary accounts himself. So we see how, along with the description of their administrative function, all these officers are also underlined as being lekhak. Now how must the scribe's behavior be? The Pishacha Lipika instructs the Kamavisdar, who collected revenue in various mahals, to reach his site early, meet the necessary officers, and remember their names. He must offer pan to those who come to greet him and have the Deshmukh alert him to who the important people are. His karkuns must already be seated at their stations, have their pens, seals, and stamps ready. And then the text suddenly gives us a glimpse of violence. It warns the karkun to check if his employer is violent towards his employees. If so, he's advised to look for a position elsewhere. But if the petty karkun is liable to get beaten himself, he too has the license of violence. The Mestaks regularly advise the Kamavisdar to make a violent spectacle of a couple of thieves during a revenue collection duty so that others might be deterred. So within this genteel world, you know, that is described, suddenly we get glimpses of, of the actual violence involved in this as well. Now the idea underlying these instructions is that the writer's skills and conduct have an immediate impact on his personal reputation, but they are also key to the health of the wider administration. His deep involvement in documentation is described through a family metaphor. So the khatavani, which contains abstracts of all accounts, is the writer's mother. It provides and nourishes, in a sense, his answers to all inquiries. The tumar, also an overview of accounts, is like his brother. It's a supportive friend at hand. The dastamal is like the writer's son. This document of the taxes owed by a village is proof of the writer's hard work. The mahal zharti, uh, an overview paper of another kind, is like a sister to him, helping explain the mahal accounts to the public at large. And finally, the baki, or the remainder of the revenue not collected is like a stepmother because she will surely land the Kamavisdar in trouble. So in effect, the Karkun's acumen in keeping the bureaucracy in order keeps himself as well as the state in order. Now, to reiterate again, we cannot conclude that the mes this is how all the mestaks actually behave, I mean the writers already actually behaved. But from these normative texts, we get a sense of how the Maratha administration was becoming more complex and through that, values and attitudes towards writing and record keeping were taking shape. These were efforts from within an emerging profession to streamline and direct conduct in particular ways and exert its authority within the state. The ideal writer of the Mestaks was someone who was seasoned in logic, discreet, tight-lipped, held his counsel, knew his mind, controlled his emotions, and acted accordingly. He was not lazy, he didn't harbor false pride, and most importantly, he didn't get his writing done by someone else. 
Now, these ideas about discretion and discipline in the Mestaks find an echo in a very different kind of contemporary text from the region, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. And this is the Das Bodh. Uh, the, the section in the Dasbodh on Lekhan Kriya Nirupan, um, the survey of the craft of writing. It is the first theme in the Dashak uh, detailing the Mahanta Lakshana um, or the different qualities of a Ramdasi Mahant. We are used to interpreting these verses in the Dasbodh as generalized guidelines to devotees and others about good writing universally. And that they were. But it is also interesting to put these guidelines alongside those I have outlined in the, in the Mestaks to try and flesh out the everyday worldview and the social sphere of ordinary Marathi Karkuns who were prominent among the followers of the Ramdasi Sampradaya. So, right. Indeed, fashion the Balbod script so beautifully, says Ramdas, that the intelligent be satisfied simply upon glancing at it. Pour the black ink into a straight hollow cylinder and proceed with bright black lines in the style of a string of pearls. The letters must be neat with all the different strokes of adequate size. All the letters from the very first to the last must look the same as if written in one go with one pen with the blackness of the ink, the sharpness of the pen tip and the incline of the letters uniform throughout. Lines must not touch, strokes must not cross, letters must not be longer than others or touch the line below. You must first draw a line across the page and then write neatly upon it, keeping uniform distance between the lines. Checking for errors must be smooth, but the writer must also render this unnecessary. A young writer must aim to entrance his readers. The letters must be of middling size and not too narrow in order to prevent problems for older readers. With sizable margins, the writing must proceed clearly in the middle of the page so that even if the edges of the paper wear out, the letters are not affected. Now these writing guidelines, I have to emphasize middling, uniform, center, uh, you know, um, these writing guidelines with their emphasis on, on these middling letters and uniformity of hand are a reflection of Ramdas's overall philosophy of avoiding extremes in all walks of life. They materialize, as it were, his teachings of a moderate approach. The middle of the road, integrating Prapancha and Paramartha in effect, is the mark of a Ramdasi disciple. His idealized literacy practice also reflects this, this stance. So the Dasbot specifies in great detail the daily reading and devotional copying that his followers ought to maintain integrated into their, their routine. And the figure of Kalyan Swami, some of you are probably familiar, is the leading disciple who wrote down the Dasbodh. It exemplifies the importance of writing within the world of the, the Ramdasi Sampradaya, especially for its core Mahants. There are many stories about Kalyan Swami's depth of, of devotion. One is that he wrote out the entire text in one night. His writing prowess, interestingly, is his ultimate bodily strength, and it is also his devotion. So how do we understand these two conceptions of the ideal writer? The Mestaks were record, you know, located in the world of Modi record keeping. The Dasbodh was focused primarily on Balbodh, devotional writing. One was about the skilled writer, the other about the literate disciple. And yet, we can perceive underlying conceptual similarities between these distinct domains. Both these ideas of ideal writing practice place the actual work or the labor of writing within a bro bro broader bodily and moral comportment. Nowhere does either specify grammar or spelling or a standardized language. Instead, their emphasis is on readability, uniform, beautiful letters, not even words, mind you, letters, and also loyalty, discretion, diplomacy, and a daily bodily discipline. Together, they tell us how the volume of writing was increasing in this period and the importance of it as well. So you see how different discussions are emerging in different places. People are trying to use this new cultural activity, deploy it for specific social and political projects. This bodily discipline was also very much caste inflected in both domains. Writing in general was the privilege of a small upper caste male elite. And this privilege was expressed in different ways. 
The world of Modi record keeping had Brahmins, Kayasth Prabhus, Shenvis, as well as various Muslim groups. Whether it was the village Kulkarni in charge of the revenue accounts of villagers, or the Kamavistar collecting the revenue, or Karkuns working for merchants and money lenders, literacy and control over written records also meant power over the agrarian resources of the population at large. Ramdasi teachings emphasized a Brahmanical social order, and the Sampradaya's main followers were drawn from among these very literate groups across the Deccan, from village Kulkarnis to officials high up in the administration. Their elevation of the elevation in these teachings of Balbod writing over Modi but simultaneously emphasizing the need to stay within this pragmatic middle road, appealed to Brahmin Karkuns, who navigated a middle path between caste-based ritual on the one hand and devotional pothis, and the use of Modi, the Pishat Chalipika, for use in their daftars on the other. So these teachings emphasize the leadership of Brahmins in society, not just through ritual status, but by foregrounding writing skills as necessary and legitimate. These interpretations of writing practice then struck a chord with Brahmin Karkuns who wished to retain their caste status, but who are also increasingly competing with other caste groups for employment. So if we probe these different ruminations on what kind of writing to do or not to do, what general history tends to see simply as the spread of administration or village level record keeping in, in Marathi emerges as a much more fraught social space of social conflict, tensions, and aspirations. And it tells us how writing in a particular script took place within a cultural matrix of religion and caste. This, um, I, and I think it allows us to see the endurance of the Ramdasi Sampradaya at an everyday level over the 18th century from the point of view of its reception among literate groups. It enables us to move away from the polarized focus on the question of what Ramdas's own position was within the Maratha state, which I should clarify is not my concern here. Okay. So from this first snapshot, uh, let us move, cut away to Tamil Nadu in the early 19th century. There was a Maratha state in Tamil Nadu, um, in Tanjavur, which had a Marathi administration that produced plenty of Marathi writing. Tanjavur is also well known for a lot of creative writing in, in Marathi, the plays and musical dramas of Sarfoji. There are a huge number of Marathi manuscripts that are preserved in the famous Saraswati Mahal library in Tanjavur. And there's also a distinct Tanjauri Marathi dialect that emerged through this process. But the writing that I'm referring to is not from Tanjaur. It's from nearby Arcot, where the Nawabs of the Carnatic had their kingdom at this time. This is my second glimpse. In 1808, a major forgery and corruption scandal broke out in Madras. The Nawab Umdatul Umra of Arcot had got deeper and deeper into debt from the 1770s. He had floated interest-bearing debt bonds to finance his regime and pay the company's army stationed within his borders. Large numbers of European traders and settlers, East India Company officers, local moneylenders, uh, bankers in Madras had invested and profited in these debt bonds. These private fortunes by company officials had shocked and rocked the British Parliament. This is also the time when the impeachment of Warren Hastings happens. Some of you might be, be familiar. As hundreds of creditors of the Nawab began to pile up, a commission of inquiry was set up to look into the matter, which identified widespread forgery of the dead bonds. One group of creditors alleged that two senior officials of the Arcot court, Reddy Rao, and his brother Anand Rao had forged the Nawab's seal on some debt bonds and sold these fake bonds to make some money themselves. Both worked in the Diwani uh, department of the Arcot court. Reddy Rao was head Maratha Sharistadar, and Anand Rao also worked under him as one of the Sh Maratha Sharistadars. They had both worked their way up as gumastas and as accountants in various taluka offices before reaching the central office. The case went to trial um, in the Sessions Court in Madras in 1809. And after a very long trial involving many European and local witnesses, the jury found both brothers guilty for forgery and 
perjury. The presiding judge of the case felt, however, that justice was not done. He felt that the verdict had been cited less on actual evidence and more due to the opinion against the brothers prevalent in Madras. He actually requested parliament for a pardon for them. A pardon was actually granted and sent by ship from London. Remarkably, just before the ship docked in London, Reddy Rao committed suicide. Now, this is a dramatic slice of company history, full of mystery, tragedy, and colorful characters. Drunken European settlers scheming with Chettiar moneylenders, Brahmin clerks conspiring to dislodge each other and hire their own family members in important positions, jealousy and competition among company officials, and a very heavy reliance, as well as deep suspicion of all kinds of written documents and writers. Was Reddy Rao guilty? Did his suicide prove his guilt? Or was he dishonored and, and unfairly treated? Hounded to his death? Doubts about the actual facts continue to linger in the local press well after the case was closed, and the entire trial transcripts were published. Unfortunately, I've tried, they do not help us decide one way or the other. However, they do provide a fascinating glimpse into the daily workings of the multilingual Arcot administration. And that's what's important for us today, because Marathi language skills were critical in this world. Now, certain documents written in Marathi were the cornerstone of this forgery trial. They were written at a crucial period between 1799 and 1800, when the suspicious debt bonds were believed to have been forged. The prosecution used these documents, which were certified to be in Ananda Rao's handwriting, to track his movements across various offices in the Arcot state. Had he been in Manarguri district at the time, as the Marathi accounts in the Amildar's office seemed to be in his hand? Or was he in the central Diwani office at Arcot, where witnesses swore that the Marathi accounts of the time were in his handwriting? It is clear that whatever his precise location at that time in Tamil Nadu, Ananda Rao was writing some accounting records in Marathi somewhere. Now, how does Marathi fit into this multilingual recording system in states like Arcot? The general pattern was that correspondence, orders, and reports were produced in Persian, but accounts were kept in Marathi in Modi script. The, Bra the Rao brothers generally used Telugu for their personal correspondence. Yet evidence in the trial also revealed that Marathi was used in other contexts. It came to light that Reddy Rao used Marathi instead of Persian for some important formal documents, and Ananda Rao drafted his will to his brother in a personal letter in Marathi. One Muhammad Sharif signed his name onto a Persian deposition in Modi uh, because he himself knew no Persian. So we see that the kind of documents produced in Marathi were varied and at various levels and contexts. This is all the more remarkable because the Rao brothers were part of a group of Niyogi Brahmins who were primarily Telugu speaking and who probably migrated to Tamil Nadu from the Golconda region uh, over the 18th century. Many such Niyogi writers were skilled in Modi Marathi writing and were also employed by the famous British surveyor Colonel uh, Colin Mackenzie during the same period. Colin Mackenzie mounted this huge uh, effort to collect all kinds of, of historical materials from across South India and built an enormous archive uh, in Kannada, Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, and, and also uh, Marathi. Mackenzie's assistants, uh, like Narayan Rao and another Ananda Rao, uh, traveled to various parts of Maharashtra during this period. They collected and copied Bakhars, Kaifiyats, Mahatmyas, and other historical information from uh, the region, and their diaries and letters in Modi are still preserved in the Government Oriental Manuscripts Library in Chennai. Across the Madras presidency, revenue accounts under the Rayatwari system that was set up by, by the British government, by Thomas Munro, was also maintained by scribes in Modi Marathi at the district level up to the 1850s, for about 30 years after the British uh, took over uh, Madras. This Modi writing in South India developed its own distinct form and local peculiarities. And even today, the eyes of a skilled Modi reader used to reading documents from the Maratha Deccan have to adjust 
to the local curlicues and, and flourishes of the South Indian Modi before it becomes fully legible. I'm sure some of you, uh, you know, are familiar with that. So we see here in this glimpse a Marathi that was primarily written. It was not really part of the spoken environment. It was a bureaucratic skill rather than something born naturally of identity and the regional linguistic landscape. It was taught within scribal families, mainly in Modi. We are used to thinking of the history of the Marathi language as naturally rooted in Maharashtra, and that if it was used in other parts of the country, this was because of Maratha political power and because Marathi migrants went there um, and naturally used their native language. But the evidence from the Arcot case that I described for you brings this trans-regional career of the Marathi language into sharper focus. It prompts us to ask, when did these Modi skills begin and how? How were writing and reading uh, sk speaking skills related? If the Rao brothers wrote letters to each other in Marathi, did they also speak it? Was it in, in Tanjauri Marathi or was their, their Marathi somehow different, more Telugu inflected? Was their knowledge of the language limited to Modi and some types of documents, or did they also participate in the Marathi cultural world that Sarfoji had, had built in Tanjaur? How did Marathi interact with other languages such as Telugu, Tamil, not to mention Persian, in this everyday world of multilingual scribes? And if they were really controlled by Brahmin scribing families, how did scribes like Muhammad Sharif learn Modi? At this stage, I have to confess, I have more questions than answers about this world. Uh, and I'm still in the process of finding sort of meaningful answers. But I think these are compelling questions, not just for South India, but for scholars interested in, in the history of the Marathi language, because in one way or the other, they are relevant for many, many different parts of the country, for Northern Karnataka, for Bundelkhand, for Odisha, even Calcutta or, or Rajasthan and so on. We really know very little about, about this, this penetration of, of Marathi. Okay, so I'll leave that for now and let's move back to the Bombay presidency for my third glimpse. Um, by this time in 1818, the British have taken over uh, the uh, Peshwa sort of uh, regime and so on and uh, established the Bombay presidency. The new regime has ushered in uh, um, an education system based on schools, textbooks, and grammars. In every regional Indian language, there was a spurt in the writing of grammars in the 19th century. The historian Thomas Trotman has very evocatively described the sudden spurt in grammar writing as an explosion in the grammar factory. Grammar became the most important framework for thinking about a language's pedagogy as well as its history, present, and future. The system based on printed textbooks most importantly transformed the scope and reach of literacy. For the first time, literacy was available, even if notionally at first, uh, to large sections of society which had been excluded from it. Rather than solely be the bodily and moral discipline of an upper caste male elite now, literacy became a broad index of civilization, of progress, of state policy, and national aspiration. Increasingly conceptualized as the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, literacy also became a matter of, of public policy debate and competing social claims. And the outcomes of this broad history are well known to this audience, so I'm not going to kind of repeat them in, in detail. Um, the rise of middle class nationalism, the powerful critique of Brahman dominance in all walks of life that was spearheaded by Jyoti Rao Phule, the modernization of Marathi prose and history writing, and the emergence of a generalized public sphere. So what I'll do now in the rest of, of the time I have is to ask what did this, how did this new conception and scope of literacy affect reading and writing practices on a daily basis? How can it help us understand how conceptions about language, attitudes to language changed in the modernity? The spread of print brought about many deep changes in how people read and wrote. Although books were lithographed and printed in Modi, and its use continued in colonial offices, Devanagari emerged as the preferred script for Marathi printing. Earlier, 
Othis were written in unbroken blocks of text. There was no word separation. And it was the reader who had to know where to separate the words based on meter or on prior knowledge of the vocabulary. Correct spelling was not laid out in rules. And anybody who has read an old pothi and, and or historical documents knows how varied the spellings used to be in these, these documents. Print, however, changed this culture of reading. Early Marathi grammarians like Dadova Pandurang emphasized the importance of visual cues to ensure that the writer's intended meaning correctly reached the reader. These cues were in the form of punctuation as well as a standardized spelling. One pause with a comma, two pauses with a full stop. He goes into great detail about this. Instead of the meter or the meaning of the text, the reader now followed punctuation in figuring out where to pause or how to modulate expression and distinguish phrases and sentences. I'm doing the same, right? I have commas. So. And there are many people, I think, in this audience who are used to reading older texts in Balbod or in Modi. And once you start, it takes you a few minutes to kind of get into the skin of the, the text and, and focus on the meaning and, and, and the letters to figure out exactly where to break the words and, and sentences. So we have to kind of switch over to this, this older method. Over the 19th century, these visual cues gradually produced a new culture of reading that was founded on the idea of a visually complete text being more accurate. This equation of accuracy with as many uh, visual cues of pronunciation and reading as possible was also important make making Balbod rather than Modi the script of choice for Marathi. So since Modi does not separate between rasva and dirgha uh, vowels, e or u, it was seen now as somehow incomplete or inadequate to properly represent Marathi in written printed text. So naturally, um, writing practices and ideas of good writing were also transformed from those that we saw earlier. Good writing was now that which encompassed the visual form of the text in script and in spelling, in the visual appearance of the correct vowel markers and dots, wherever nasalization was required. So writing, in short, what I'm trying to say is became more literal. Standardized writing rules, which were called Shuddha Lekhan, nowadays are increasingly known as Praman Lekhan or Lekhan Niyam, became important within language discourse. And over the years, successive reforms of Marathi orthography have tried to make it as phonemic as possible, which is to say, as close to actual pronunciation as possible. The Shuddha Lekhan debate has been a lively and complex one for over a hundred uh, years, and my purpose here is by no means to fully discuss it, nor to settle it by any means. Uh, what I've tried to do, and what I'm trying to do, is to tease out from this debate how the modes of disciplining writing changed from earlier times. So such standardized writing rules also took place within a changed social scene. More Marathi speakers from different backgrounds became literate and began participating through handwritten and printed text in a growing generalized public sphere. This gave rise to the idea of a new kind of ideal yet anonymous literate person in this public sphere, the Samanya Manus, or the ordinary Vachak Lekhak. Uh, around whom all the debates around Shuddha Lekan have been conducted. So if you look, at those who argue for simpler reformed writing rules closer to actual pronunciation, they invoke this Samanya uh, Vachak or Samanya uh, Manus as the, the school child, you know, the first generation school goer who needs simple writing rules to pass exams and become successfully literate. And those who argue for the older etymological rules also invoke a Samanya Vachak, but someone who is apt to be confused by the simpler writing rules and who now, you know, which they specify pronunciation, but not the actual meaning of the word. So since now does not have a, a timba on na anymore, it's difficult, they say, for the reader to know whether it's referring to now as now, name, or as hodi, uh, now as boat. So both positions, therefore, emphasize good writing as standard spelling which enables ease, convenience, and transparency for this ordinary reader and writer in the age of mass literacy. 
the idea that this ordinary literate person, the samanya manu, so samanya vachak and lekhak, must work within a disciplined system of rules, however, has persisted. The more literacy became infused with the people, in short, the more writing was undergirded with rules and standards enforced above all through examination marks. So what happened to Modi in all of this? Right? Modi handwriting in the modern era also changed. It was also shaped quite literally by the new primers used in schools. Letters were set individually into separate words in printed Modi text. And in handwriting, it remained cursive, written fluidly along a line without word separation. But this line itself became somewhat roomier. And its letters now sat slightly apart from each other like passengers on a crowded train do as it becomes emptier nearing its destination. So, so subordinate clerks in the colonial revenue, judicial, and other departments continued to use Modi. Ingraskalin Modi is much easier to read than its pre-colonial versions, as many here will, will uh, agree. It's something among Modi readers. Ingraskalin, that guy's name. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> now, the material, physical act of, of handwriting, however, became part of an increasing interest in fast notation. Modi was no longer fast enough for this modern age. It, it, it began as an effort to write faster in, in medieval daftars and so on, but in the modern age, it was not fast enough. The need was felt for a script that would write Marathi even faster than Modi could. So several shorthand or speed scripts, therefore, were devised from the 1870s onwards in Marathi to address this need for speed, which became, in effect, shorthand for modernity. So this is my final glimpse into the history of writing, the world of Laghu Lekhan. The first speed script that I've been able to trace is from 1878 by Ramchandra Bhikaji Gunjikar, the polymath scholar and editor, uh, Vidnyan Vistar, etc. And he wrote this book called Laghavi Lippi. And he declared in the introduction that he was, he was supplying, he felt a great need for a script which can enable even faster writing than Modi is able to, to listen to a speech by famous people and speedily write down that scholar's, scholar, the speaker's scholarship verbatim right there and then, so that a newspaper might publish it the next day. Gajanan Bhav Vaidya published Laghu Lekhan Paddhati in 1881 with another speed script. There's a lot of competition between them. Gunjikar thought that Vaidya was plagiarizing him and, and so on, a uh, little controversy. Uh, and in 1893, Bhujang Rao Mankar invented a third script. Now, Mankar's script became the most famous of these, and he is now usually remembered as the father of Marathi and Gujarati shorthand. All these innovations drew on Pittman's efforts um, at developing English shorthand for quick office writing. The Marathi shorthand scripts were aimed first at bringing public speaking speedily and accurately into the realm of print, like Kunjikar hoped, but they quickly came to serve another purpose, that of police surveillance. From the Swadeshi period in particular, the colonial CID began to employ shorthand writers to attend public gatherings and take down records of possibly seditious utterances by nationalists and later socialists and communists. <clears throat> it's not that funny actually. <clears throat> Mankar worked for the press and the CID as an English shorthand reporter. He was one of many reporters who gave witness in the trial of the famous Meerut conspiracy case between 1929 and 33 against various trade unionists and communist leaders. The accusations against labor organizers like S.A. Dange, R.S. Nimkar, and others were based on their speeches at various meetings. The cross-examination of witnesses in the trial turned on the accuracy of the transcripts of their speeches. So, and, and the trial materials, again, you know, they are, they are now available fully um, digitally as well. And they give us a very rich window into this kind of daily uh, surveillance writing documentation. How easy was it to produce a speedy verbatim report of an oral speech? 
The general practice among the police reporters was to transcribe the shorthand writing of speeches in various languages, Marathi, Gujarati, Hindi, etc., into English longhand notes as soon as possible, the evening uh, later on or the following morning, while the memory was still fresh. Mankar's practice was to take down the Marathi speeches into English shorthand, and he translated on the spot. But the CID inspector B.B. Deshpande noted down speeches directly in Marathi shorthand, um, and his long experience with this kind of surveillance enabled him to classify various orators, not only by their political views, but also their speed of speaking. So he gives a long list. J.S. Karandikar was the fastest speaker he had encountered, 130 words per minute, S.M. Paranspe, 120 words per minute, Dange is 110, and, and, and so on. So, now, these reporter witnesses were also tested on their skills in speedy notation in court. And they were asked to reread the, their own shorthand, which they had recorded during the time of the speech itself. It's remarkable. Mankar was unable to read his own shorthand. Uh, uh, yeah. And he could not even provide the Marathi originals for the English phrases that he had written down. And then, then we get to see actually, you know, what the pathos of this is, because he complains then that the lighting in the halls is poor. The reporters have to sit far away up there somewhere, you know, hidden from the speaker with their notebooks on their thighs instead of at a table. And it was difficult to listen properly and take notes quickly and accurately. Deshpande, Bibi Deshpande, revealed that since the Pitman system matched signs to specific sounds rather than words, he did not really pay attention to what the meaning of the speech was when he was writing. He just noted down the sounds as best he could, even if he didn't understand the words. And this gap between words and a meaning is later on filled in through memory or by the CID itself. <laughs> And, and this tells you, I mean, what the real purpose of this surveillance also, also is. Uh, so not surprisingly, S.A. Dange's own defense dismisses the evidence against him and says that the shorthand writers either did not know Marathi well enough to translate it speedily into English shorthand on the spot, or they were not conversant with communist terminology to, be under, to understand what they were, they were saying. <clears throat> so, in any event, Marathi shorthand scripts continued into the 1960s, and the new Maharashtra state had positions, textbooks, and exams for clerks until the surge in typewriting made them outdated. The heyday of the shorthand scripts, however, is important, I think, uh, for the cultural history of writing because it reveals a crucial shift in the way handwriting came to be perceived in the modern period. It no longer had to be simply beautiful and uniform and readable to a small group of devotees and, and cartoons. So you couldn't just say Shuddha Neteke Lehave. It had to be fast, it had to be accurate, but it also had to be legible enough to be verifiable. In other words, if print offered a new level of readability and speed of reproduction, practices of handwriting were also reshaped in the light of this change. They had to keep pace, as it were, with printed text in different ways. So I don't mean, by saying this, I don't mean that now people had to copy manuscripts as fast as the printing press was, was churning them out, but the attitudes to handwriting in general, to the concept of, of handwriting, not just shorthand, but in Modi as well, changed in the light of print. Handwriting had to be quick, it had to be more widely and anonymously legible. Answer scripts scribbled in time-bound exams um, had to be legible to unknown university examiners in order to get the right marks. Office superiors looking for signs of forgery had to be able to read depositions and proceedings written speedily by clerks, and judges seeking to verify seditious speeches had to be able to verify that sedition in the handwritten transcript. So the value placed on speed in writing rather than beauty and uniformity um, raised the bar on how fleeting an utterance could be captured accurately in text. These possibilities brought with them an amplified concern with authenticity and an expectation of its fulfillment. 
Thus, we see efforts to grapple with authentic transcription in petty offices as well as courtrooms. There's a whole sort of story here about how Modi is sought to be removed in the 1910s and 20s from offices and Balbodh replaced um, there because the British officials are no longer able to read Modi like they were in the 19th century. So the suspicion about what exactly these clerks are writing is heightened now and there is an order that that they, they should be, instead of, of Modi, Balbod writing, which the clerks, of course, kind of, of protest against because writing fast in Balbod is even more difficult than in Modi, but it still has to be legible. It still has to be readable. So it increases the workload in, in, a, in a sense. And con at the same time, because sort of nationalist uh, interest in Maratha history and so on is increasing at the time, the kind of Marathi public sphere sees this as a kind of insult to Modi by removing it, saying that it is the script of the Maratha nation, we must keep it in the offices. And there are many sort of crisscrossing ironies throughout this whole uh, process. Today, we are in another era of transition from printed text to electronic text, and from handwriting and typewriters to electronic data entry on keyboards of different sizes, desktops, laptops, tablets, mobile phones. The media are changing, as are the actual bodily acts of, of literacy, typing as opposed to handwriting, texting as opposed to full typing, and reading and scrolling on electronic screens versus paper, to just mention a few changes. You might say that audiovisual recordings resolve a lot of these problems of authenticity, speed, uh, and, and verifiability, and, and so on, that I've identified in writing and printing. But there too, as we know, anybody who watches the news every day, is it is not easy to determine whether a video is fake or genuine. In fact, the very proliferation of, of audio and video also causes anxieties about its genuineness to proliferate. So these questions that I've outlined above um, of how such shifts in media and practices of documentation affect our cultural understandings of text, of communication, of language, and literacy are entirely relevant to this current transition as well. It's ongoing, uh, and its effects in these deeper cultural terms may already be happening, but they still remain to be, be seen. But I think one value of looking at this earlier period of, of transition in this kind of cultural history perspective also offers us then some tools and cues to think about what is happening now, today, in our uh, world as well. OK, so I'll step back a little bit now. So writing, when associated with composition and creative expression, has a powerful emancipatory charge. Writing against an established grain has always been integral to movements of resistance. Mass literacy in the age of print, and now increasingly in the social media and electronic age, has enabled literally hundreds of thousands of men and women to express themselves individually on a range of, of topics. These are critical to a history of writing as literary history, as a history of human expression, as a history of politics, uh, and, and so on. But what I've tried to do today is not to deny or limit this power of, of writing, but to shift the focus a little bit towards writing as, as documentation, writing as an everyday phenomenon associated with petty bureaucracy and the ordinary business of life. We have glimpsed the world of accounts, petitions, letters, balance sheets, devotional copying of pothies, examination answer sheets, and shorthand notes. These are all forms of documentations that we do not generally associate with literary history as such. But I hope I've been able to indicate somewhat that there is actually a lot of cultural production, a lot of cultural meaning making that happens around such ordinary forms of documentation as well. The writing, I've tried to suggest, has been a meaningful cultural practice through the association with certain ideas, values, and power relations in society. These have both changed over time and have remained persistent, uh, remarkably persistent as well. If good writing in the early modern period 
was part of the bodily discipline of a small upper caste male group in the age of mass literacy, it came to be disciplined through standardized spelling in the public sphere and associated with speedy accuracy. The two glimpses into the world of Arcot and shorthand surveillance also tell us about how ordinary writing is persistently associated with the idea of legibility. And by legible, I mean not just literary, literally readable, but also transparent in the way uh, the anthropologist and theorist James Scott uses the, the term, for instance, being legible in front of the state. So transparent to concerns about accuracy and authenticity, but also transparent to the gaze of state power, something that I think we are all grappling with today. The very act of documenting something brings with it, you could say, fears about its authenticity and fears of, of forgery. And cultures have developed over time ways of attesting documents for their genuineness. Um, Bhavani Raman's wonderful book, Document Raj, which I encourage everybody to read, underscores how the importance of written documents increased in everyday life in modern India while also harboring a constant anxiety about their genuineness. She has a wonderful history about, about the cultural importance of the signature and how it changes and how such sm seemingly small things have very, very large impacts uh, you know, across the social field, uh, the kinds of, of pattas that peasants, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, can then access from the changed uh, revenue office and, and so on. It's a wonderful study. So in bureaucracies, especially the colonial bureaucracy in India, and also I think the post-colonial one, the fear was rampant among, among officials that native clerks were cooking the books. This fear was linked to the many languages and scripts and different writing practices that existed together in the same office, the kind of multilingual space that, that we saw in, in Arcot. Much effort, therefore, was spent in making both the writing as well as the writers legible, as in transparent to state surveillance. The same writing skills of shorthand were also used to make political thought and activism transparent to state surveillance. So the definition of verbatim itself does not remain constant. We think verbatim, of course, we know what verbatim means, but it keeps shifting throughout this, this process. Sometimes it means gist, sometimes it means summary, sometimes it means translation, and only sometimes does it actually mean verbatim as we, we understand the dictionary meaning of it today. Nevertheless, this value placed on verbatim writing made it critical to determining guilt or innocence, and therefore, you know, the fortunes of somebody's life. This ultimately, I would say, this importance of, of legibility, its power to generate cultural meaning, and it's sort of like dance, if you will, with creative writing. You know, we think creative writing is, is sort of um, um, free in a sense. We, we talk of freedom of expression and, and, and so on. And there is a certain charge that creative writing has, which we associate immediately with, with resistance and, and the power to, to make change. Documentation, on the other hand, seems kind of dry and drab in, in, in comparison. But then creative writing can also be in the service of, of, of uh, power and underwrite you know, sort of problematic uh, politics. And we see sometimes that documentation can also, legibility can also work in different ways where you can refuse to make yourself transparent to the state by participating in its documentary processes. So this is what I would say is kind of like the underlying kind of, of um, charge in, in my, my research to understand what the kind of political field, the deeply political field is of what we think of as very ordinary documentation. So. So much for writing, and some of you are probably wondering what about language. Uh, so what do all these glimpses and insights from the multi-regional and multi-scriptual career of Marathi imply in Marathi writing imply for a cultural history of the language itself? I would say that one of the biggest conceptual shifts that we can identify from the early modern into the modern period is the concern from writing in Marathi to, the, to that of the writing of Marathi. 
So what do I mean? I mean, in other words, that over the medieval period, although there is a lot of literary and documentary writing in, in Marathi, this remained dispersed in different domains. And we have seen that there was crit little critical regulation of the language as a whole. In the modern period, this idea of the language as a coherent object of study and how best to regulate it as a whole, no matter what kind of writing was done in it, became very important within language discourse. So Dadoba Pandurang famously described uh, his effort at creating a grammar for Marathi in the metaphor of grooming the unkempt language with the comb of, of grammar. Mm. Uh, you know, Vyakranachi <clears throat> Fani is what he calls uh, his, his uh, grammar. Now, this critical scrutiny of the language as a whole, as a coherent object, also took place within a new historical framework. Debates over the present condition uh, of Marathi also prompted, con you know, sort of uh, um, debates over what its origins were, what its historical development was, and how what its temporal sort of trajectory was in historical linguistics. This is the time when William Jones and the other Orientalists have identified the um, Indo-European language family. Francis Ellis has done that for the Dravidian uh, language family, and all discussion henceforth about what Marathi's past is and what its future is will take place within this um, framework of historical linguistics and the language uh, family. And there has been a lot of, of writing about this. I have not it's part of my work, but I've not sort of brought it uh, uh, here uh, as such. But I, what I will say is that um, Another concept that bears kind of, of uh, closer study in this kind of cultural history way is the idea of etymology, right? Uh, where etymology means a particular kind of grammatical function in the earlier times, but it comes to be seen as a historical source. Uh, so words literally become historical documents as Vika Rajwade describes them, and they become key to understanding how Marathi developed from Sanskrit to Prakrit uh, and to, to Marathi uh, itself. And this timeline is very long, right? It's, it's over, over centuries, over, over millennia. And in recent times, we also know there has been the demand for a classical status for Marathi based on, on these fresh claims regarding a, a very long antiquity. But be that as it may, and the historical glimpses that I've tried to outline in my talk today reveal a very different picture of Marathi's cultural history. They show us a language not rooted in deep antiquity that you can access through particular words, but a language in everyday use, in different scripts, in diverse multilingual spaces, in different parts of the country, and among different groups whose mother tongue, as it were, might not even have been Marathi. We glimpse through this history the kind of short but very important role of a shadow cosmopolitan link language that the Marathi language played for a very short while as the, Mara the Mughal Empire was retreating in the subcontinent and the East India Company was uh, advancing. Several multilingual scribal groups like the Niyogi Brahmins, but, but many others, several uh, groups of, of Kayasthas, several uh, you know, <clears throat> other sort of ethnic groups across the, the, the region used Marathi Modi writing skills in the wake of Persian, as Persian is also retreating with the, the Mughal Empire, because Modi Marathi has a lot of Persian vocabulary and also drew very heavily on Persian documentary forms. So it allows Marathi then a sort of brief kind of subcontinental uh, uh, cosmopolitan role before the modern Anglo vernacular regime of education took over. I've given only a few glimpses, uh, but as I said, there is plenty to be researched of this period about Marathi's reach, its usage, and the attitudes towards the language. We are so used to automatically assuming you know, that a history of the regional language Marathi must, in a sense, be equivalent with the history of the region of Maharashtra, which in turn must be a history of native Marathi speakers. But if we shift our focus to users, usages, and practices of language, script, and writing without assuming that they are all the same, we get a much more rich and textured cultural history of language. 
I hope I've been able to present before you at least a little bit of an interesting slice of this history. Thank you.